last name. Super app, right? Super app. 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 Super app.
uh, of Visual Arts at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the senior editor of Art and Technology nonprofit arts organization Rhizome, and the special projects coordinator at the New Museum. She's currently a visiting lecturer in critical studies at the University of Southern California. She's taught at Scripps, NYU, as well as San Francisco Art Institute. An avid writer, she has written for Art in America, Rhizome, Art Asia Pacific, Art Forum, The Wire, and many other publications. And this last year, she released her first book, Expanded uh, Internet Art, 21st Century Artistic Practice, and the Informational Milieu, <laughs> which was released by Bloomsbury Series, Inter uh, Bloomsbury Series International Texts and Critical Media Aesthetics. Um, it's great to have you back. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming Cece Moss. Um, I, I'm, I'm so happy to be back at PNCA and um, touring Alien She here was like when Astria and I started working on that show we like we have to bring this to Portland this show needs to go to the Pacific Northwest so we were thrilled to work with Mac and bringing that show here so thank you and thank you Jesse and thank you MK for um, such a warm you know welcome and it was wonderful also meeting a lot of the MFAs yesterday too so thanks for your time. So I was joking over lunch today with Mac that um, I'm kind of doing a combo platter today of a talk. Uh, so the first part I'm talking about my new book, Expanded Internet Art, and then the second part I'm talking about gas. Um, so I sort of combined two different um, uh, talks into one, so I hope it works out. I'm sure it will. Um, and yeah, so, um, uh, so I'm just going to uh, go right into it. Um, so this... Uh, book came out in September um, and I wanted to give you the background uh, for the book and then um, I'm going to basically explain the two sort of key terms in the title expanded internet art and informational may you and then I'm going to pivot and talk about gas so that's basically the framework for the talk today so this was my PhD dissertation at NYU, which I started writing in 2009. Um, but then um, as these things take some time, I'm sure you've had friends who've gone through this process, um, it was approved and written from 2011 to in, f until 2015. And it was developed in New York City in the midst of a lot of discussions around post-internet. Um, I was working at Rhizome at the time, which as you mentioned, is an art and technology organization. Um, at the new museum and many of the artists that I was writing about thinking about were also my peers um, who I would see regularly and in fact there was a reading group at the time um, that was organized by Jean McHugh who wrote a book called Post Internet um, and Bad Brad Trommel and some other artists um, so um, you know I was basically uh, a lot of the ideas and conversations were really um, uh, coming out of a a conversation with community and in fact in the acknowledgement section um, I talk a lot about that because uh, when I was developing this book um, you look I was reading other acknowledgement sections um, and uh, one thing you realize um, in that process is how solo writing a book can be so like a lot of other um, authors are the only people they think are like the archive librarian who they who was the only person they talked to for four years while they worked on the book or whatever. Um, but I feel really grateful and thankful that um, this was something I wrote in community and with community. Um, and I'm always like thinking with artists um, and I feel like this project is a reflection of that um, and I have a lot of gratitude about that. Um, so yeah, so this was written during a very specific moment. Um, and um, it's also, I want to mention that it was written in a specific moment before a lot of the commercial galleries took the sort of post-internet term um, to sell work. So there's something that seemed very authentic about those conversations at the time too. Um, and um, I also, just as a framework, wanted to just talk through what was happening with social media during this period too. So um, this book is really charting uh, and, and looking at and reflecting on artists uh, who are making internet art after social media, um, you know, at a time, uh, you know, it, like th things were happening in culture and we were and a lot of the artists around me were responding to it. But just so you understand what was happening, um, uh, this I'm going to just walk through a brief timeline of social media in the 2000s. So in 2002, you have Friendster. 2003, you have MySpace. 2004, Facebook. 2005, YouTube. 2006, Twitter. And then from 2007 on, um, you have iPhone, the iPhone and Tumblr. Um, but also with the iPhone you, and with smartphones, you were basically able to access the internet anywhere. And that was huge, right? Um, so you have to remember that I start 
working on this in 2009 and it was just recently that people had the ability to um, access the internet on their phones. So that really changed a lot of things. Um, and artists were starting to experiment with using social media as a platform. And it seemed at the time qualitatively different from a lot of um, earlier internet artists because of the commercial performative and mobile aspects of that space. Um, and artists were also responding to like the weird artistic things that were surfacing as well. Um, so for a while at Ryzen, we actually had this blog uh, series called General Web Content, where we would post like videos of ASMR videos um, from YouTube and that sort of thing that we felt were like artistic and strange and we didn't and un maybe uncategorizable, but also something that we felt was um, affecting a lot of the artists who were responding. Um, so this was this book was written while all of those things were happening, um, and I've been joking in this in this book tour that it's an example of perhaps like recent art history because the internet has changed so much since 2015. So I just want you to also keep in mind that as well. Um, so the book is organized in four, but uh, four separate but related chapters. The first chapter, which is the one I'm going to be talking about a little bit today, argues that artists are creating work that is intentionally expanded as a product of an informational milieu, which is a term invented by Tiziana Terranova. Um, so I'll be um, explaining and defining uh, expanded internet art and informational milieu today. Um, so in that chapter, I discuss work by Harm van den Dorpel, Carrie Altman, and Artie Verkan. Uh, chapter two provides a larger framing for Terra Nova's notion of an informational milieu and its root in uh, Guibert Simondon's philosophy uh, by exploring the meaning of the term milieu within Simondon's work while reading this concept alongside um, Simondon's colleagues who are also writing in the 1940s and 1950s in France, um, uh, George Kengilheim and uh, Raymond Royer. And then chapter three uh, reads the informational milieu as part of a larger postmodern experience by um, looking closely at uh, Jean-Francois Leotard's 1985 exhibition Les Imitériaux um, and Leotard's writing about art and technology um, in the 1980s. And then lastly, the chapter four returns to artists who work in an expanded fashion in the 2000s um, in order to think through a subs how a subset of these artists are intentionally addressing images within an attention economy. Um, and so in that chapter, I talk about Kate Stekiu, Kaja Navaskova, The Jogging, and Timor C. Quinn. And that chapter basically asks, asks more of expanded internet art practice, and it encourages artists to seriously consider the complex commercial reality of the internet and its influence. So um, now I'm gonna talk about two key words from the book, expanded internet art and Im informational you. So you have a sample of the argument. Um, and then I will follow up with more of a recent conversation of my uh, curatorial work. And I also have the books with me today. Uh, so if you want to cut be um, Bezos out of the conversation and buy from me direct, uh, you can do that too. And, um, and, uh, and they're $5 cheaper than online. So, you know, just a quick plug there. Um, so expanded internet art. Um, so in the book, I argue that internet artists working uh, parallel to the rise of the internet's ubiquity again, uh, think about the timeline that I provided. Um, so this is occurring re re roughly from 2006 to 2013. Um, these artists are increasingly making things that float back and forth between network data files and physical materials. And these works are nimble and flexible. Um, and so they can be a sculpture, an installation, or a file. And the term expanded in front of internet art calls attention to its open-ended approach. Um, and there's an acceptance here that the artwork is not inert and closed, but evolving within its network situation, and it's constantly negotiating the different supports that enable its movement. So this is the definition I provide in the book of what expanded internet art is. Um, I say it's a continuously mobile element that exists within a distributed system, a continual becoming, an artwork without an object or center, without an autonomous singular existence. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm basically saying that this expanded artwork, it reproduces, it travels, it accelerates across different spaces and forms. Again, it can be a sculpture, uh, it can be, um, you know, a, a data file, etc. cetera. Um, and it's always reconstituting recon itself um, by when it circulates in these spaces. So that's very abstract, right? Um, I'm gonna actually um, talk through is some like concrete examples so you have an understanding of what exactly I mean. Um, so this is an artwork that I talk about at length in the book. Uh, this is Artie Verkant's Image Objects series. Uh, it started in 2011 and he's still doing it. Um, and these works exist as both physical sculptures and altered documentation images. So basically, Verkant work begins with the work as a digital file, which he precision cuts and prints on Sintra in order to resemble the design, giving it to the dimensionality of sculpture. 
And then these prints are hung uh, in a gallery and documented officially in the form of installation shots, he, which he then uh, alters um, to create derivative works and new forms, which he posts online. So basically what you're having, what you see, all the images that you see online, um, and uh, when he first started working on this project, Contemporary Art Daily really was like a major website that people were looking at. Um, so you're just thinking, so, so basically all the documentation images are heavily photoshopped, but then the um, images printed on the Sintra are also photoshopped and circulated online. So you basically, um, the sculpture exists both like in these circulated images and then also in the in, in also on on the images that are printed on the surface of the object um, so there's a circular process basically between the file and physical object and back again and it uproots the work and it basically and in, in my view exists the work ends up existing somewhere in between right um, it's not just the sculpture it's not just the documentation it's not just the circulation of the images it's all of those things right it's an assemblage of all those things um, already Verkant also did a spin-off project um, called image uh, of this image object series um, called similar objects um, and this is from 2012 um, oh, actually, yeah, 2011, excuse me, um, in which he searches the image objects images to gather a slideshow of algorithmically determined like images that share the same basic arrangement and color scheme, such as photos of white shoes and post-it notes. So this is, this is kind of uh, an extension of the project, right? So we saw with image objects, he, um, he's creating these sculptures, he's documenting them, the sculptures themselves are also um, featuring um, images that have been circulated and you have to go this back and forth, back and forth. Um, but with similar objects, he's basically um, taking the images from image objects and then you and then kind of um, routing them through this search by image option, right? Um, and so I think both, so it's a way in which to kind of uh, engage with how these images are circulating online through, um, through an algorithm. Um, so both similar objects and image objects do away with any notion of original and copy and basically equalize all instances into assemblage of likenesses. Um, and I think they respond to and participate in the cyclic transform trans transformation of his output from JPEG to sculpture to searchable image and back again. Um, and I think um, what's uh, so compelling about Verkan's work is he's very much in dialogue with the means and ways of information distribution. So um, in the book, um, I argue that expanded internet art is a product of an informational milieu. Um, where informational dynamics optimize the production and transmission of digital information within the immediate environment. So for, for me, and this is the argument I make in the book, the key issue in expanded internet art is not that internet is online or offline, real or virtual, net or post, but that all art is increasingly embedded within this informational milieu. So let's talk about this key term. Um, so um, this term uh, is actually uh, something I um, encountered in grad school uh, when I read this book um, by Tiziana Terranova. Um, and I actually, um, I was in a graduate seminar with Ale um, taught by Alex Galloway called The Politics of Code. Um, and it was one of these classes that really just changed everything for me. And actually, um, I could name a number of uh, upcoming books that basically were produced from this one seminar. So it really was like one of those groundbreaking things. Um, but I, for me, um, as you know, a graduate student encountering this book, it really helped um, clarify a lot of the things that I was thinking about. And again, uh, remember, I'm you know talking about this work with my um, with like artists and, and and my colleagues at the time too. So um, this in Network Culture Politics for the Information Age, Terra Nova develops her term informational milieu through a reading of French philosopher Gilbert Simenon's concept of a milieu. Um, so, um, as I mentioned a little bit at the beginning, um, during the advent of cybernetics in the 1940s and 1950s, um, Gilbert Simondon was in France, um, and he was uh, responding, you know, to some people like Norbert Wiener, um, and he basically, uh, through his theory, was describing how things emerge in relation to their environment as a type of becoming, one that was explicitly pre presented itself in opposition to what he felt um, in 
kind of um, uh, both British and American cybernetics as um, hylomorphic and substantialist tendencies of dominant theories of information. Um, and so, um, and one of those um, theories that he was looking at was the Shannon Weaver sender receiver model of communication, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and what um, Simon Doan did um, is he posited that there was no content proper to any elements within a system, and I'll unpack this in a second, and form as signal um, is never abstractor from matter as noise. So for him, when he's talking about um, information in this very early moment, um, he sees it as incessantly engaged in a continual process of exchange within a metastable mayu full of potential energy. Um, and he always sees uh, communication as containing um, the terms of its milieu and not abstracted from it. So let, let me, I'm gonna break this down so it's a little bit more concrete for you. Um, so this is the Shannon Weaver model of communication. Um, and um, this is, so if, if you ever, I, if for those of you who've ever been in a media studies class, this is like something you encounter that the first few weeks, it's so sort of grilled, drilled into your head. Um, so, you know, uh, this was um, written in 1948. Um, so clearly one of the forms of mass media during that time was radio. So I think that's a good example of how to walk through this. Um, so you have the information source, uh, it transmits a message through a transmitter and then um, you send the signal and then the receiver receives that signal and then the message is received. So you think about like um, a radio signal, right? And making sure that that is clear and that there's no interference with that signal. Um, and so the role for engineers in this, in this, um, in this structure is to eliminate noise, to make sure that, um, that the signal is received and that the signal is clear. Um, and one of the things that Terra Nova talks about in network culture is that she says that in an information age, basically signal become more important than signs. So as someone who's doing their PhD in comparative literature, that kind of blew my, my mind, right? That, that we are in, um, in a culture where signals have more significance than signs, right? Um, and so, um, so you know, um, to go back to the story about Simone Doan, um, so he's looking at this, and he actually sees this as a, a he um, sees a lot of uh, issue with, uh, he takes issue with this understanding of information. Um, and um, uh, he um, instead, uh, and I love this part of um, Simone Doan, um, he instead thinks that reads information as more uh, like the crystal in the mother water. Um, and um, he sees that basically um, instead of it being just the signal and everything um, being um, sort of optimized for that signal, that basically information contains, as I mentioned, all the elements of the mayu. So the mayu would be like the mother water around the crystal and the crystal itself. And so for Simon Doan, he's seeing these things um, operating in a symbiotic uh, relationship with each other, um, and so um, for so here we are in um, uh, uh, in, in with uh, Terra Nova. She's looking back at Simon Doan, and one thing I should also mention about um, Simon Doan and media theorists, and actually talk about this at in depth in the book, is that um, a lot of American media theorists were sort of rediscovering Simon Doan through Deleuze, um, and it's only recently that a lot of this stuff has been translated into English. So I, I think it's important, like when you're sort of throwing theorists around, to also just be mindful of like how they kind of entered in kind of anglophonic circles and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, so Terra Nova, she's reading Simone Doan um, and, and, and sort of thinking about um, his theories of information. Um, and she sees that his ideas are compelling because of their understanding or his understanding of basically Simone Doan's understanding of information is compelling because his conversation is not about the content of communication, right? Just the signal getting across, but an unfolding process within its material constitution. So Simone Doan is saying that information unfolds within its material constitution and Terra Nova is like really kind of, um, you know, that's the thing that she's like, aha. Um, so uh, for Terra Nova, um, she, uh, through Simon Doan, she's saying that these informational processes exist in an environment in a way that is inherently immersive, excessive, and dynamic. And again, the visual of that would be the crystal in the mother water. And that points towards an interpretation of information that is not reduce, reduced to this, which is just signal and noise, right? Um, so um, this is the definition that Terra Nova provides of an informational mayu um, in network culture. Um, she says um, that um, information is not simply the content of a message or the main form assumed by the commodity and late capitalist economies, but also another name for the increasing visibility and importance of such massless flows as they become the environment within which contemporary culture unfolds. In this sense, 
We can refer to informational cultures as involving the explicit constitution of an informational milieu, a milieu composed of dynamic and shifting relationship between such massless flows. So just to recap, um, information is not the content of communication, but an unfolding process within its material constitution. It's immersive, it's excessive, it's dynamic. Um, and then she, and Terra Nova also sees that the active power of information is everywhere. So everything is modulated and reorganized to be more legible as information, inclu including cultural artifacts and processes. And so, you know, again, um, uh, what I'm seeing when I'm reading this book um, is that, um, that that expanded internet art is um, an expression of this informational menu. That artists like Artie Verkant are, um, if they're making this decision to have like an assemblage of likenesses, and that's actually the artwork, not just like one single piece, um, knowing full well that most people will only see the dot installation footage of the work, um, then um, this is a, basically artists basically adapting their practice understanding that their work exists within an informational mayo um, and that and and that and that's kind of one of the key things that I'm thinking about in this book um, but um, towards the end of the book I also talk a lot about the attention economy um, and how sort of capitalism works online um, so it's not um, enough uh, for you to like um, effectively circulate a number of images around your work and then kind of go in between the, um, you know, these network data files and the object, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, um, I want artists to really critically uh, think about how um, their work operates within these platforms and, 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 and are complicit in those cl platforms too. So the, the, these are kind of like the high level um, ideas that are discussed in the book. Um, and I just wanted to give you uh, a small taste. Um, and yeah, so I, um, and just, uh, you know, I finished this project in 2015. I was picked up by a publisher in 2016 and it was finally published in fall of last year. Um, so that just gives you also a timeline of like, um, you know, the, 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 the project. So um, I'm going to sort of pivot now um, and talk more about my curatorial work and the organization I founded called GAST because there is a lot of shared territory and I think you'll see that in a second. Um, so um, uh, this is my gallery. Uh, I, it's, um, and I, so I, I basically, I moved to LA in fall of 2016 and I started this space in fall of 2017 and I moved to Los Angeles basically because I wanted, I knew I could probably, st I was coming from the Bay area. Um, and I didn't feel like it was possible for me to start an art space from scratch. And after working in arts institution, like really amazing, incredible arts institutions for 15 years, I really wanted to do something different. Um, and I also felt uh, confident that I could start something from scratch. Uh, so I moved to LA. Um, I um, met with a, a number of friends um, who have also started their own art spaces. Originally, I thought I would move into a storefront and live in the back um, and um, uh, do the gallery in the front. Um, but one of the things that came up in a lot of the conversations uh, with my friends who do run um, um, alternative art spaces in LA is that um, geography is a huge barrier. So, you know, if you have a gallery on the west side, only west side people see it. If you were on the east side, only east side people see it. And and as someone who just moved to LA, I really wanted to engage with everyone everywhere. Um, and I also was coming from the Bay Area um, where I saw um, a lot of examples of mobile um, art spaces. So one of the big inspirations for this project was um, The Bus, which is a, um, a mobile performance venue that uh, was created by John Benson. Um, so he bought an AC Transit uh, bus, which I guess, I don't know what the, I don't know the name of the city bus here. So he bought a city bus, like a huge bus. He gutted it and turned it into um, a, a performance venue. So so they used to have like noise shows and punk shows and stuff all over Oakland. Um, and he actually toured it. Oh, it was also run by, by on biodiesel and he toured it to Brooklyn and I helped organize like a music festival on, on the bus. And it was like one of the most beautiful days of like, uh, I mean, it's hard to even describe it. it was such a great um, um, project to be involved with. And so it was things like that. I was like, oh, I don't need to do the storefront thing. I can maybe do this differently. Um, and so much of this project is, um, you know, an attempt to try to think of um, organizing an art space and curating out, um, outside of like traditional sort of frameworks. Um, so this is the mission statement uh, for GAS. Um, so I say it's mobile, autonomous, experimental, and a network platform for contemporary art. And then I say a lot of other stuff, which you can read um, silently to yourselves. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to go through the kind of key terms so you have a sense of 
like with the project. So I say it's mobile. Um, so that means it's flexible. Um, it's um, there are multiple sites uh, for the project. Um, importantly, um, the art the exhibitions exist both. Um, offline in the truck and online on the website. So I use every available space as an ex exhibition space. So every show there's an online component. Um, and then um, and then the, the gallery itself is only eight by 10 feet. So it's quite small. Um, so I use every space. Like um, I've put stuff in the ceiling. Um, I wear, I've worn work before. Uh, and I've even talked to artists about doing like, um, like performances as part, I'm like, everything's open, open. Um, I've done uh, installations in the front driving cabin. I've done performances in the, drunk, the front driving cabin. Um, so there's a real, a lot of like, um, experimental and mobile uh, options with this, with this space. Um, but I also have been able to, um, uh, do pop-ups of the truck all over LA. Uh, so I, for each show, so I do three shows a year. Um, they're up open for three months. I'm open one day a week. And then I, I partner with an artist run space to, to open the truck every week. So, you know, I can be like, Hey, go to tin flats or go to, um, night gallery. I'm there on Saturdays and people know to go there. But then I also am always doing pop-ups. Um, and so, um, more, most recently, Recently, I was at Spring Break Art Fair. Um, I had a show open about a week and a half ago. It's going to, there's this really awesome um, uh, artist initiated um, project called Other Places Art Fair, uh, which it happens at Angels Gate Cultural Center, which is a former military base in San Pedro. And um, uh, uh, the curator, Keith, basically invites all these artist run organizations to do site specific projects all over this former military base that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. And it is one of my favorite events in LA every year. So that's coming up. So I do a lot of things like that as well. Um, um, it's a, yeah, so this project's autonomous. Um, uh, um, so it operates as a fiscally sponsored nonprofit. Um, so that allows me a lot of, um, uh, I can apply for grants, but then I also do an addition for each show. Um, and the additions help support the project. Um, and the additions are really affordable, um, usually under $20, so that my, fr I, my friends can buy it and, and the artist friends can buy it and then live with these objects. And then that basically helps pay for each show. Um, yeah, and then um, and then I always I talk about it more as a platform um, instead of a gallery. And I, I I'm gonna kind of um, I have like a little chart to maybe talk about this. So this is another um, shot of this space. Um, so this is sort of uh, um, you know I'm sure there are people who have better graphic design abilities in this in this room than I do. But this is like uh, kind of a sketch of some of the things I've been thinking about with this space. So um, you know tradition in more traditional sort of white cube spaces, you have like the container, right? The white cube gallery museum. Then you have the content the artwork and that produces the meaning which is the exhibition so it's I feel like it's a very linear and kind of boring way and problematic actually way of understanding like how to organize an exhibition um, but as you can see and, and so much of the language here is so inspired by my PhD project too so I am hoping you'll kind of see that there's a lot of crossover here. Um, I'm sort of seeing gas. Um, so instead of a container, I see it as a platform, which is an active agent. And as I mentioned, the exhibitions include the website. Um, they include the actual mobile gallery pop-ups. I also do a publication for each show. I do free zines. So I use my, um, like, uh, my in at various, uh, uh, institutions of higher education to get free copies basically um so and so and to give away the zines um and then um and then the artworks themselves in every medium so i've shown video um yeah i've shown video sculpture painting performance installation you name it um so artworks in every medium i see as an active agent and then also the mayu itself there's these responsive changing conditions for which we're in for in which the exhibition exists right because i'm going to all these different places um all over la um with all and and the other thing i should mention too is when i do pop-ups um i'm i'm also very mindful of i don't um unless it's like an intentional part of the the show um and i have an example of that in a second um i really try to um, um always be invited and have a host host me so i because i don't want to just like jump into someone's neighborhood and i'm really mindful also about like gentrification in la and um and and being sort of thoughtful and careful um about the space in that way and and um um so in, in that way i'm always like an i'm always a guest everywhere i go um but then um in the one instant the couple instances 
where I have done like guerrilla style pop-ups. Um, I did a show called anatomy of oil that looked at oil extraction in Los Angeles. Um, and LA is the largest urban oil field in the United States and there are active oil wells all over the city. Um, so I did a show where we parked the truck at these active oil wells and did like performances and silent listen, the silent meditations and all sorts of other projects with artists. Um, so that people became more aware of this thing you see everywhere in LA, but you don't necessarily see. So in that case, like when we did these guerrilla pop-ups, it was, it was like intentional, very like, you know, it was part of, part of the, um, part of the show. Yeah. So this is sort of, again, I'm, I'm, I'm still working through, I, I, I'm like very open about the fact that like, I feel like gas is a, is a, it's an experiment. So I'm still, you know, I'm still thinking about what it is. Um, but I do, uh, feel like the approach is, um, reflective of a lot of like my other, other work. Um, and, um, yeah, so this is another, uh, shot of the truck. Um, and so here on the left, um, this, you can see the addition. Um, so this was a show called common survival and I'm going to talk about two X, um, I'm going to go deep into two exhibitions that I did. I did in the truck today too. Um, but, um, just so you have a sense of like what the, sh the shows are all very different. Um, here we, this is a show at a zine library. Um, the addition, um, was, um, a piece that was a print on um, this um, seed paper and anyone who bought the seed paper would have to plant it into a garden. So this was an ecological show. And then we also had zines. So I always have zines. I always have additions. Um, and this for this show too, I don't know if I have an image of it. I also, um, um, this was uh, curated by the Institute of Queer Ecology um, and everyone who, I was a temporary member of the Institute of Queer Ecology for the show. So I wore a uniform too for the exhibition and greeted people in uniform. So again, I also, so I'm very open. To, I'm like kind of a part of the part of the piece and sometimes depending on the project. Okay, I'm going to talk about two shows um, that I did recently. Um, I would talk about the most recent show, but I it's so recent I don't have install shots. So sorry. Um, and I didn't want to show like crappy Instagram photos that are kind of blurry to you guys because it is a really um, beautiful show. Um, so um, in 2019, um, all of the shows um, were um, by artists who were consider considering world building, science fiction, and utopian po possibilities in their work. And I felt, you know, given the rise of fascism and bigotry within the United States, and especially with a heightened awareness of the greater political climate of fear and instability under Trump's administration, I felt it was imperative that an independent space like GAS uh, would try to create room to imagine alternatives, engender hope, empower resistance, and build communities. So that was basically the framework for a lot of the um, shows that I organized last year. Um, and actually, a lot of the shows this year, too, are um, in, in that space. Um, Anyway, so this was uh, a show the, uh, ha I had up in the fall. It was a solo show by Sonia Gerdas, who's a Los Angeles artist. Um, and for basically the last decade, she's had this conceptual science fiction project called the Oxygen Energizer, uh, where she imagines a future in which machines create energy from oxygen and breathing is recognized as this connecting force between all life. Um, so she, um, and actually the show um, sort of emerged from a studio visit we did even before I started gas where she had applied actually for a grant to buy a car to to create a space for the oxygen energizer um, and then um, and then I ended up doing gas and, and then we were able to do the show together um, so she turned the um, the truck into a hub for this oxygen energizer and um, visitors were invited to um, um, breathe together within this space um, in order to kind of in create a sense of collectivity um, and then we had a number of different performances interactive workshops in order to have a dialogue around air and energy's balance balance potential um, so she was really seeing the, sh the truck as like a gathering space so this is um, um, the sort of outside of the the truck um, I, I partnered with the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery um, to park the truck there um, so I was there every week um, and um, basically uh, you would take your shoes off um, and we carpeted the bottom and then you would pull up this um, the silk um, and um, you would be in this meditative space um, where um, um, where Sonia had hung all of these pink silks and then she worked with um, 
this um, musical group in LA called Electronic Sound Bath. And so there is a sound bath, there's like this um, audio looped piece in the space and only two people could fit into the the gallery at a time. Um, and so people would just sit and sit in there and um, breathe together. And that was sort of the intention of the work. Um, as I mentioned, everything is used in the space. So um, one thing I was really excited about with the show is that Sonia did car magnets, which was something I've always wanted to do. So I was so happy to find an artist who was like, yes, let's do car magnets. Um, and so she also has this whole kind of um, uh, sort of visual catalog uh, around the oxygen energizer um, and this sort of figure. Um, and so uh, we printed um, uh, car magnets um, in the space. Um, we also had a video in the front driving cabin. Um, this was the addition that we produced for the show. Um, this was a reusable glass straw. So we were thinking like with air or in breath that having a straw would uh, make sense. Um, and it says oxygenenergizer.com air for free. So if you go to that website, you have like the 10 years of her research around this oxygen energizer project. Um, so it also kind of goes back to the web too as an, as an object. Um, and then um, this is one of my, we did so many public programs with this show, but this was one of my favorite um, programs. Um, this was um, in collaboration with Eliza Swan um, of the Golden Dome, which is a sort of artist led school school in Los Angeles um, for magic. Um, and um, she's, uh, she's a sort of psychic and a healer. Um, and so she did a, ran a workshop called Oxygen as Love Spell, Plant Telepathy and Ecstasy, where she invited people to bring their sick um, um, house plants um, to the Los Angeles Municipal Art Galleries. Um, they, uh, well, in the, where the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery, there's this thing called the Pine Grove, which is this beautiful space with like tons of trees and grass. And so every, um, and so everyone showed up with their, their, their house plants. And then she led like a meditation and a channeling with the house plants to bring them back to life. So it was really, it was really sweet. Um, and it was also a, one of these, like uh, the thing about this location, it's like on a, um, hill in Los Feliz that has like one of the best views in LA and then we were um, parked the truck there basically when, when, at, when, when in LA we called the golden hour when it's just like the whole sky turns pink so the whole sky actually looked a lot like um, Sonia's like pink silk so it was just like to spend every Saturday there was unbelievable and I felt so lucky to do that but this was just one of the like we did a ton of other public programs we also did um, we um, collaborated with Flax which is a recently closed um, non profit that um, supports um, site-specific projects around LA and they had a drive-in movie theater um, and so um, Sonia um, uh, performed um, she's also a performance artist so she performed as this character um, and she um, led this meditation with the cars um, who are in the driving drive through um, the at the at this like um, movie theater this outdoor movie theater um, so we did a lot of like fun projects and I, like I said I'm, I, I love doing um, public programs with these shows and collaborating with a lot of different groups to do each for each project depending on the project um this is another uh show so this was the summer show um this is uh a show by anatio alaruena um and it's called uh tw uh Twa, these world worlds are here so um i, I met tio while doing a residency um at the H hiap um, organization in um, helsinki in finland um and um uh, we uh started talking about doing a show together um, and so I was able to get a grant from Frame to bring Tio to LA to basically do a residency uh, where they um, produced, they had, ran a writing workshop, an exhibition, and a performance. And Tio, um, uh, uh, their training is in both like arts education and performance. Um, and so um, they uh, ran this uh, writing workshop at Naval um, uh, for uh, queer uh, folks and women identified folks um, to basically write science fiction write science fiction for the world that they want to inhabit and actually embody that world so a lot of um, um tio's research is also looking at live action role playing so they um the writers in this workshop it was like a five a four day workshop um every day um and all of the people in the workshop um basically were writing the kinds of worlds they would want to inhabit and then actually kind of inhabiting those worlds through live action role playing. Um, and so um, I, it's a really, um, and, and Tio has run these workshops at, um, in, in Berlin and in other places in Europe, but this was the first time that they've done something in the United States. So the project began as this um, writing workshop. So this is Naval. Um, and Naval's um, a really incredible um, artist run space in LA. Um, 
they are such a huge inspiration to me and like um what they're doing i think is like really really uh interesting and, and, and lovely, but um, I was so I was thrilled to work with them on this project. Um, so basically, um, TO ran the writing workshop um, in July, um, and then everyone, um, you know, uh, sort of engaged in that work over the over the four days. Um, and, um, and then we took that writing and we um, um, created a publication, but then also everyone also uh, recorded the stories that they wrote, and that became an audio installation in the truck. And then, um, uh, then the then um, excerpts from the text were also written on the walls. Um, and then we also had an animation by Annie Polaka, who's another Finnish artist, in the back. Um, so this was, um, and, and so people uh, would just sit in the truck and listen. Um, and the other thing I should actually mention with the show, one of the strange, surreal things that happened is in the first 30 minutes of the workshop, we had the biggest earthquake in LA in like, I don't know, like 15 years. It was a seven point um, earth a uh, seven point on the magnitude um, and so um, a lot of the stories were sort of about kind of um, like and then everything went back to normal even though it was like absolutely terrifying um, and so I think um, there's this way in which a lot of the stories were also imagining kind of like climate change and like sort of future catastrophes and the fact that it gets even in the face of that we normalize it um, and so uh, if you listen to the audio there is all these sort of conversations uh, or there's a there's a there's a lot of discussion of earthquakes and stuff and I think it just like really set everyone in this in this specific way because that's how the workshop began you know uh, it was very very weird um oh this is the publication that we did for that um and that included um stories writing sketches from the people in the workshop um and then um i also um parked the truck at the women's center for creative work which is another incredible organization in la um that supports um feminist art practices and um feminist creative practice um and they actually have a um, print shop so I was able to um, uh, resograph the covers for the publication using their print shop. Um, and then I parked the truck there every day for um, um, a few weeks um, and people came and saw the show. Um, and it was a really, I mean, it, uh, it was a really great um, project. And then we also did some public programs too. So Tio is a performance artist. Um, and uh, oh, so this is another pop-up we did at um, Ochi Projects, which is a, um, a commercial gallery in LA that primarily, I think almost exclusively shows uh, Los Angeles artists. Um, and then um, Tio also did a performance at um, Human Resources, um, which is a, an, another um, awesome uh, artist-run space in LA that's focused a lot on performance. Um, and so, um, and then we parked the truck outside with the show. So as you can see, all of these exhibitions have like so many different um, places in which they live. Um, and I wanted to kind of conclude with this quote that was an inspiration uh, when I first started uh, working on gas. Um, so I'm, sh I'm in a room full of artists, so you know when you're like thinking about a project and you like are reading something and you write it down in your notebook. This was one of those like uh, quotes that I sort of wrote down. Um, so this is from Nicholas Borio's The Radicant. Um, and he says, art is not defined as an essence to be per perpetuated in the form of a closed and self-contained disciplinary category category, but rather as a gaseous substance capable of filling up the most disparate human activities before once again solidifying in the form that makes it visible as such the work. So when I thought of the name gas for Gas Gallery, obviously it's like, it's in a truck, it's cute. But also um, I was thinking about sort of um, art operating as a gas, you know, and like filling up all these different activities and connecting um, in that way. Um, and so I, I, it was, it, this, this, this quote was really helpful in clarifying that. Um, and that's all I have. I'm, I can open up to questions. Here's all my information if you want to stalk me on various social media platforms. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So. So any burning questions or anything? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm constantly, constantly, constantly doing studio visits with artists. Um, as I mentioned, like even this, the my book project was something like I, I, I can't really think without artists. Um, so um, a lot of these things just come. It's hard to describe, but a lot of these things just sort of come into being. Um, 
And I mean, like with Tio, we did a studio visit and we just talked for hours and I was like, I want to work with this person um, and I need to figure out how to do it. Um, but also they um, have their practice lends itself to, that's the other thing that happens a lot too, is that the um, parameters of gas are so unique that often um, the artists I work with have a practice that can like apply to all of these different spaces. Um, so, and, and then sometimes, um, you know, I have um, the programs planned until spring 2021 because I have to write grants and fundraise and stuff. Um, but, um, but also, so there is some lead time, but then also sometimes things come up to me last Last minute you know so it's just um and I, I yeah I I know that's not a very like precise answer but a lot but it's but I'm as I mentioned yeah I'm always I'm just I'm always meeting with people and things just happen like even and that, I feel like that's actually true of a lot of the curatorial projects like even Alien She like I wanted to do a show about Riot Girl and then um uh, one of my former colleagues, um, Lauren Cornell, knew Astria and knew that she was working on the show and she put us together. And this thing that I've been thinking about doing and this thing that Astria had been thinking about doing for years finally happened because the conditions were right for it to happen. So I've done a lot of, it's it's like, it's some intuitive, some, some something else that's beyond us kind of thing. Yeah. Any other questions? I saw, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, so each, so, um, last year was the first year that I did like solo shows. So I usually do like group shows too. Um, so what I showed today were like the two solo shows I've done and that meant, and those two solo shows involved new commissions. So it was a kind of different way of working than having, um, group shows with existing work. Um, but also like logistically, basically I plan the calendar year. I'm always also always talking to or arts organizations all over LA. Um, and then I go to tons of events all the time. So people are like, Hey, you know, do you want to do a pop-up next week? We have something happening. Um, and so, uh, some of the pop-ups that aren't like programs, um, happen just because people invite me to do stuff, um, either like six months in advance with like 50 billion emails or just like show up tomorrow. So, and I can, I can, I can do both of those things pretty easily. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's just, it depends on the project. Um, the current show that just opened is called custom. It's about car customization and identity and how, um, the car, especially in the United States is a symbol of like freedom and mobility. So when people customize it, um, it often brings up, um, like sort of assumptions and ideas around like gender and class and things like that. Um, so it's a group show and it includes a lot of already existing work. Um, but, um, you know, I, um, am doing like as um as i mentioned i'm doing the pop-up at um other places art fair i'm also um um there's a um, micro cinema called um now instant image hall who have like a really good program so we're doing a whole um uh, film program of like uh, uh artists made films around car customization that and it's not artists in the show um and then i'm parking the truck outside of their cinema um so that so these again it's just like i was i talk i just reach out to people all the time i know a lot of people and then some things just happen the way they should like and um and it's kind of just this synchronicity kind of thing but then also i'm just also always like telling a lot of people like los angeles municipal art gallery want me to come back and i'm like here's what i'm doing for the next two years like what works for you yeah oh two questions in the back I actually been thinking a lot about um, um, the early internet art in the '90s and its 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 relationship to globalization movement, anti-globalization movements, um, and I've been thinking also a lot about like the 
the kind of alternative art space that I'm doing um, and um, wanting to maybe kind of connect those things a little bit more. I feel like, um, but I also, uh, you know, I got a really great question the other last week when I was at San Jose state talking about the book, um, where someone, uh, an artist in the, uh, the audience was like, what would the, um, internet, uh, like what would internet art look like if it wasn't fully determined by this like commercial space? Like what if we had a different internet and then what would the artwork look like if we had a different internet and the story was different? And I was just like, I was like, I don't know. I can't even, I was like, I don't know what that would look, you know, like it's, and it's something I've been still like, what would that look like? And um, so that's it. But I also, one thing I love about that early moment in the nineties is that artists were, it, the, the internet was starting to take shape. So I, um, that's something I just want to, I would love to like return to. Cause I think there's, and I actually, um, wrote kind of, uh, I wrote an essay for the net art anthology that looks at that early nineties moment. Um, and it's about disruption and, um, sort of di what disruption meant for, um, you know, critical art ensemble and some of like those sites, types of groups. And then what disruption became in the 2000s when it became like this catchphrase for innovation and in, in the tech industry. So that essay, I think working on that essay, I'm like, I want to, I don't know. I feel like there's more that can be done there. I know that's like a little bit all over the place, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty well documented. Um, and the other aspect is, um, and I'm saying this as a person who doesn't have a smartphone or cell phone, um, it's a constant need to record everything we do, constantly not being present. You go into Forest Park and half the people are either screaming into their phone or you know, recording their uh, feelings. I noticed in the photos of the bus, uh, in each photo there were, there were two photos where there were seven people, one included a baby. And out of the seven people, in one photo, one was checking their email or recording, and in another one there were two. And um, I'm wondering, I mean, obviously artists have responded already to that. Um, but for me, as a person who, for instance, I co-host a bike show here in Portland on cable, and my co-host is obsessed with constantly recording, constantly, you know, how many people look at our message. And for years I resisted uh, being mm -hmm. part of that, in my opinion, madness. Um, I always felt that the people who need to listen to our show will, will listen, uh, if not in this life, in the next life. But um, eventually I joined it, so now I have an account. It's, uh, I use a literary hero of mine, so I don't need to have my own name. But uh, I'm wondering, and maybe that's in your book, uh, you know, if you address those kind of uh, dominant features, and obviously artists have probably responded to it, adding to more of the, you know, kind of not being here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the chapter, chapter four, which I didn't talk about that much, talks about um, basically ask basically ask that artists like attend to this attention economy and critically attend to it. Um, and um, I have this. Um, yeah, uh, and I talk a lot also about how our attention is changing. So um, uh, one theorist, Mark B. N. Hansen's recent work was like really important for that chapter, as well as Catherine Hale's um, writing around um, attention in her book, How We Think. So um, that chapter really goes addresses exactly what you're talking about, saying it's not enough to like have your work circulate in all these spaces, but that um, artists really need to be um, thoughtful about and, and, um, you know, um, intentional about how, um, um, the, our, our attention is being changed basically in those spaces. I think I saw another hand. Did I see another hand over there? No, no. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I need to add more slides to the web this website. So every show there is a web p 
piece. So like right now for custom, um, I just have, I have a video by Nikita Gale. Um, and, um, for Sonia Gerda's show, we actually had a plugin that showed the air conditions in Los Angeles uh, every day. Um, so a, a, an exhibition that's looking about breath and air and air is energy. That was important. Um, let's see, um, for common survival, which was the show that was um, curated by the Institute of Queer Ecology. Um, we had, um, there was a, there was a, um, a icon that would link to a web based project by one of the artists. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of all. Of, so yeah, I need more, I need more slides of the web stuff. So, so thank you for reminding me to do that. But yeah, for each show, it, it really is different and it depends. Oh, for like Anna Tio Alaruena, um, Tio made this like animated GIF. Um, so when you would go to the website, that's what you would see and you have to click through that. Um, so it just depends on the artist and the project, but it, I try to always have something. Um, and I actually need to get better at like archiving that. Um, I did a lot. I updated the website and that's the other thing. I do everything. So I install the shows. I built the website. I update the website. I do all the PR. I do, I like, do, I'm like there, um, sitting gallery sitting every week. Like I do, I print the zines. I put together the zines. Like it's, this is a very much like a one woman operation. Um, so but yeah, I mean, and it's really fun and awesome and exciting. But um, but yeah, I there's anyway. So I updated the website with some more stuff. But I really needed. I was thinking recently, like I needed to do more to archive some of those projects. Especially, um, there are a number of uh, web projects that are standalone websites that are separate from Gas. Um, so I need to um, do more. I think in terms of like making sure that those 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 sites don't just disappear. So yeah, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. And if you want a book, I have them. And uh, I thank you so much for in the invitation. It's been really lovely. Yeah, take care. Yeah. I tried well because I feel like I didn't talk about it at San Jose State and they're like why didn't you talk about your curatorial stuff and I was like oh I didn't know you want me to do that hi how's it going yeah yeah I can do a Venmo 25 bucks or a PayPal oh really yeah you can PayPal me too hi how's it going I'm Cece nice to meet you I might have change if you need if you have cash. Sorry, I didn't bring a swipe or anything. I'm like, I'm not like an actual. I can't believe you don't have something like that given your. I know. I'm like, I'm like,